This is cool. <laughs> All right, you guys fire ahead. I'm Wes Teeman, and I'm a beef pro. I'm Brett Spader, and I'm a beef pro. You tell me. I'm hearing my own voice, which makes me nauseous. I'm Dustin Dean, and I'm a beef pro. I'm Annie Allen, and I'm a beef pro. Ow, now, brown cow. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tracy Brunner, and I'm a beef pro. I'm Jess Priles, and I'm a beef pro. My name's Lee Albert. I don't know whether I'm a pro or not. <laughs> Welcome to the Beef Pros Podcast. I'm Ben Spitzer along with my friend Garrett Thomas. You bet. Uh, today is a interview that I've wanted to do ever since we even thought about doing these uh, podcasts. Uh, Mr. Lee Alford uh, is, uh, I would call, a, a good friend and uh maybe even a hero in some respects so uh mr alford we really appreciate you sitting down with us and uh I'll well I, i'll add on to what ben said and, and working with the brangus breed and being involved in the brangus breed at least somebody that i've probably known known of uh for for a long time i had the privilege to know better uh, more recently but uh, as we started to put this idea together together of the podcast uh lee was definitely I think maybe even one of the first two or three names we had on the list. So I know we've said that a few times on here, but uh, uh, it probably is not more true than what it is uh, here today with sitting down with Lee. So, Ben, with that being said, why don't uh, uh, you you obviously are a little better uh, with the the stories that Lee's told you. You've had a little more time to deal with that. So why don't you get us started and and push us down the road here? Well, I guess Mr. Alford, just kind of give us a bit of a a history lesson on where you come from and – and those type of things, and we'll deviate and jump around a little bit like we always do on here. Well, I was raised in Caldwell, Texas. Uh, my family, my great great grandfather hit here in 1831. Uh, my great grandfather, Alford, was here in 1849. Uh, the family has been here ever since. Uh, My grandfather was born in 1876 in a a dirt-floored log cabin. And from there, he has told me about when he was a kid coming to town in a wagon. There wasn't a gate in the 10 miles it took to get to town and the prairie chickens flying up from under the wagon. Uh, Things that people will never get and see. Sure. Absolutely. Uh, he went to work, bought himself what they called a confectionery. I guess it was an ice cream store or whatever. Uh, but And started putting land together and started building a ranch. He, um, I was kind of his boy. Uh, my dad was in the insurance business and if when I was a kid if I had my choice of either going to the insurance office with my dad or going to ranch with my grandpa it was a no brainer it didn't take you long to make that decision I was with the old man (laughs) and And, uh, he had me on a horse when I was young young uh he also bought me a hat because you did not go bareheaded around that old man, and it stuck. I can sit in this office, and if I've forgotten something in my truck, and I go out to get it, I'll pick that hat up off that rack and put it on my head before I go to the truck. <laughs> it's ingrained. Absolutely. But uh, he, I was five years old, and I was all over this town horseback. Uh, got my share of tongue lashings for what I did horseback but was taught how to do it right Mm -hmm. and uh, but and taught by the best he knew what he was doing Mm -hmm. uh He would give me a terrible tongue lashing 
but he never laid a hand on me. At one time, we were shipping calves, and I don't know, I was seven, eight years old, and I had two cows in there that had calves. And we had the calves in a pen, and it was an old ragged piece of pen that you'd had back in those days. And uh, he uh, cut out the calves that we were going to sell. And uh, my two calves were in there. And he said, uh, I asked him, I said, how are you going to tell mine? Oh, it doesn't matter. We're going to give you average. Well, that didn't work because I thought mine were better than average. And I waited till they went behind the barn. And they had an old ragged gate in there. And I went in there, went to try to sort my two calves out. And it didn't work, work very well because the whole bunch hit that old ragged gate out they went. It looked like a covey of quail going up the hill when they came around, and I knew I was in a little bit of trouble. <laughs> and uh, he had me sitting down, and he was cussing me like you would not believe, but he wasn't hitting me. And Daddy ran up and shoved him aside and said, let me have the little son of a bitch. <laughs> And he explained to me <laughs> the error of my ways <laughs> where I understood completely. <laughs> but uh, from then on, it uh, it evolved. Sure. And uh, as a kid, um, it was a small town. I had my horse in the back in a bar in the pen in the back. And I had show caves down on the other end of town. And I'd get up at 6 o'clock in the morning, saddle my horse, ride down, take care of my show cattle, come back, unsaddle my horse, change clothes, and go to school. Until I got old enough, you could drive a truck when you before get a license at 14. And um, when I got my license, then I could start going down there and taking care of them in the truck and didn't have to ride anymore. But uh, I never, it was a different situation. Back in those days with the Interscholastic League uh, than it is now. Because if you won anything, you were not eligible for any sports at Interscholastic League if you won any money at anything. And I could not rodeo because I knew that I wanted to play ball. Mm -hmm. And I could not take a chance on rodeoing. Because if I if I placed and won two dollars, I was no longer eligible to play ball. Oh wow! So I couldn't. Sure. And um, I'm glad that I did. But uh, this day and time, they people, the young men, young women can do both. Sure, sure. But, you you talked about you mentioned you mentioned playing football there. Why don't you? Uh, I believe you. Uh, uh, Played at that university over there in, in Austin that we don't like to talk about in College Station. Oh, you Aggies will learn what's the best one of these days. <laughs> Why don't you tell us a little bit I'm, about your? I'm uh, staying out of this. <laughs> about your uh, about your football playing. Well, when I was lucky, very lucky, uh, my abilities in football came from my mother's side of the family. Uh, in 1936, SMU played in the Rose Bowl. And of the starting 11, two of them were my uncles. Oh, wow. And uh, they, my, the Alford side is not as big as my mother's side was. And uh, I, uh, my abilities came from my mother's side. But uh, I was lucky in that I had several scholarship offers. And uh, I didn't want to go across the river with y'all because I'd been raised right next door to it and there was 4,000 male students over there. And when I did my visit to Texas, was roundup weekend and they took me about two or three of those sorority houses and when I saw that there was no doubt in my mind 
<laughs> where I was going. Damn, a bunch of Aggies. I'm going over there where these girls are. <laughs> where, uh, where, where else uh, did you did you consider going to play? Uh, Rice, TCU, and I had an offer from an from A and M, but uh, Rice, TCU were the main two others. SMU also. I could have gone to SMU, but those are the opportunities that I had. But there's no doubt in my mind that I did right. Uh, I was in Darrell Royal's second class, and he was probably the greatest motivator I've ever known. Uh, he, when you were a freshman, they put you through a little series of stuff right after your freshman season. And they weren't doing but one thing, and that was just checking your guts to see if you'd quit. And Frank Medina was the trainer. He was a little short Indian, about 4'10". And he lined up a bunch of benches in the dressing room and had every ball, the freshmen, sitting facing the benches. And he had the benches in there where when he screamed at you, he was looking at you in the eye. <laughs> and he walked up and down and he called me Caldwell. And we started out with five pound dumbbells. And you had on gray sweats he had the temperature at about 115 or 20 in there. And you started out, you know, you're 18, 19 years old, don't know how strong you are. And you swinging those dumbbells like it was pencils. But after about 25 or 30 minutes of it, they weren't swinging quite that good. And it got worse. And he walked up to me and looked me in the eye, and he was standing on that bench looking at me. He said, and I was trying, he was telling me to get them up, and they just wouldn't come up. And he said, what's wrong, Caldwell? You ain't got no guts? And I wanted to hit him so bad I didn't know what to do, but I couldn't pick my arms up to hit him. <laughs> <laughs> but as I said, it was just a gut check. Sure. They wanted to know. If it was the fourth quarter and you were behind, were you going to quit? And that's where they learned. And that, that hot room, it thinned, them out, huh? it thinned the numbers down, I can promise you. But uh, it, was, it was an experience that, that you'll never forget. Uh, one of Coach Raw's experiences, expressions or sayings that he had a lot of them was he talked about winning he said you know tying is just like kissing your sister and when he got into your mind he was a winner because he made you believe you were going to win it was bad in some ways when you got into business because in business there's times you need to quit, but you got mad and you wouldn't quit because you you were not allowed to quit. <laughs> but uh, you could be behind 10 points in the fourth quarter and there was no doubt in your mind you were going to win it. And the few that you lost, if you'd have just had two minutes more, you would have got it. And that's that's... That was the reason that man was such a winner, because he could get into a young man's mind and put his, make him mentally prepared to win. And that's all he went out there for. He didn't go out there to play, he went out there to win. Sure. When you played for, uh, for Texas, what, what position did you play? I was a tackle. You were a tackle. What, uh, what was your height and, height and weight back in those, those days? That was in the 60 minute day. <laughs> and these 300 pound boys that they've got playing ball right now can't play for 60 minutes <laughs> if I got over 240 they put me on the fat man's table 
and that was skim milk and all such as that, and you didn't want that, so you stayed under 240. <laughs> but I was 6'4", 235, 240, where I played. But then I played tackle, both offensively and defensively. Oh, wow. Played both ways the whole Played both ways. Don't see that too much these days, that's for you sure. You don't see it anymore. No <laughs> such Especially thing. not at that position, that's for <laughs> yeah. sure. Well, um, I guess – Tell us a little bit post, and we may come back because those stories, I've heard several of your Coach Royal stories that are amazing, but tell us a little bit kind of after you finished up doing that, kind of where you where you went after that. Uh, when I got out, I crippled. And uh, I got a leg torn up. And uh, they didn't have the techniques back then that they've got now. And they told me that with time, it was, uh, they laid me on the table and held me like with my leg straight, this right leg, and they could take my foot and go at a 45 degree angle, lay it on that table. But it did not tear the ligaments, it stretched them. And my leg was just, and I got to where it had tightened up, but it never, ever got completely tight. And uh, as time went on, it got worse. And finally, I got to the point where I had knee replacement. And uh, the uh, surgeon that did the surgery on me was, he was a quarterback on the team that I was on. And uh, after it was over with, I said something to him about running, jogging, whatever. He said, no, you do not. These things are not built to take that bam, bam, bam you get from jogging. You can walk fine, and that's the I can. He said, but you can't run. I said, well, what if I'm in the pen with a fighting cow that is about to get my butt? He said, for your life, it's all right. (laughs) So I'm going to make sure I got this straight. The quarterback on your team... Did the surgery on Was me. the man who did the surgery on your knee. Again, right. one of those things you'll probably never see ever again. <laughs> that's that's fascinating. That's right. And you still keep up with several guys that were on that team, right? Oh, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. My two roommates were the uh, starting tackles on the 1964 National Championship team. And one of them is an amazing story. Well, his name's Gordon Roberts. His dad was dean of men at Purdue. But he had been dean of men at Oklahoma when Coach Rawl was at Oklahoma. And Purdue was Big Ten. And this was Sandlot football down here. And he wanted to play ball, but nobody in the Big Ten would give him an offer. Wouldn't even let him walk on. Said he couldn't make it. And his dad called Coach Royal, told him that he had a son that uh, wanted to play. Would he give him a chance to walk on down here? He said, no, I won't give him a chance to walk on. I'll give him a scholarship, send him down here. (laughs) And that was back in the days when they had unlimited scholarships. I was a tackle when I was freshman. I was I was one of sixteen freshman tackles. Hmm. Oh wow! But this young man who would not be given a chance to to walk on in the Big Ten was a starting tackle on the nineteen sixty four national championship team. Hmm. Huh. Wow! Wow! <laughs> I could sit here and talk about your football stories all day, but I guess give us. <laughs> Um, how how did you get into ranching? And I know you're from your grandpa. And they you they called him Big Lee, right? Excuse me. They called your grandpa Big Lee, Mister Lee, Mister Lee. Okay. And you were Little Lee. I was Little Lee. And there are to this day some of the older black folks that still call me Little Lee. <laughs> But uh, he was Mr. Lee and I was Little Lee. And so did you come back here 
and start ranching when you got out of school? I, yes, I came back and I, uh, oh, I went to work at an auction barn. Along with that, I think I was making a hundred dollars a week, if I'm not mistaken, if I remember right. But it was buying groceries, and then I had my cattle, and my my granddad let me have one or two places that he had, let me use them, put my cattle on. And then uh, when he got to the point where he could no longer go, well, my dad put me in charge of all of the ranching operation. And uh, so I, I started managing the family ranching operations. I also, uh, started order buying, and um, I worked for an order buying company for several years, making six auction sales a week. You were on the road then? I was on the road, drove lots of miles, and uh, you didn't get a lot of sleep in those days because it was back in the days of big, big runs, and I've what, uh, what barns did you work? Uh, toward the end, I had Huntsville on Monday. Then I was close on Tuesday. I had Brian. Mm -hmm. I went to Center on Wednesday, Groveton on Thursday, Nacogdoches on Friday, and came home Saturday from Livingston. Hmm. You were in the East Texas. I was East in Texas the East market. Texas market. <laughs> and, uh, oh, it was good. And, and, also, along with order buying, uh, I, I was selling cattle. And I had some friends that I had known when I was in the auction barn and that were had a feedlot. And I had four or five feedlot customers that if we had 10 orders or 15 orders for the company I was working for, three of them might be my orders. And I was making as much on sales commission as I was on buying commission because I was selling two or three loads of cattle a week during that period of time. But I got tired of the road. I, uh, one time they sent me north for some reason or another. And I went to Ardmore, Oklahoma on Monday and got through there about two or three o'clock in the morning. Laid down for a little while and went to, I don't remember, somewhere else on Tuesday. Wasn't a very big sale there. I was through by 8, 9 o'clock at night. Drove to Clarksville. From Clarksville on Wednesday to Paris on Thursday. Got through just in time to drive to Texarkana for it to start. Got through at Texarkana the next morning about 9 o'clock. Had 300 miles to go to get town, so I took another pill and headed home. And uh, I got home and I laid down on the couch. And I'd had, for the week, I'd had about 10 hours sleep. Whew. And uh, I piled up on that couch and my wife came walking in. And she says, you know, I've here been here all week with these kids. I have not gotten out of this house. I don't get to go anywhere. You're off going all over the country. I want to go somewhere. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I just got up, took another pill, and went to Brian and took her to the picture show. <laughs> <laughs> but that's when after that I got a chance to lease an old ranch out in far west Texas and I leased that country and started ranching the desert and I can tell you one thing when you cross the Pecos River you learn how to ranch all over again it's absolutely nothing in that desert out there like it is down here sure. totally different why don't, you, uh, why don't you tell us about some of the challenges that you maybe didn't see coming when you, uh, when you made the journey west? Well, the first thing that, you, that I had to learn, I guess, 
was you if you're out there you better know how to work on a windmill because there is no water and them old windmill out windmill men out west if they catch a green east texas fella in there they will rob him unmercifully <laughs> it'll cost you so but i had a friend that was a trapper out there and he said, oh, I'll teach you. So we we learned how to work on them. And my youngest son, Bruce, every now and then he would be out there. And if we were working on a windmill, Bruce is pretty bad about being scared of heights. And I could be up on top of one of them hanging by my tail, and I'd forgot a wrench or something that I needed. And I'd ask him to bring it up to me, and he wasn't fixing to crawl up there. I had to climb all the way down to get it and then go back up there. So I learned that I took a bucket and a rope when I was up there, and anything I needed when Bruce was down there, just drop the bucket down and then pull it up on a rope because that's the only way I was going to get anything. But <laughs> you, you, you learn, you've got to learn your grasses. Sure. You've got to learn what carrying capacity is. Uh, it's it's a totally different situation. You, I mean, hay is out of the question out there. Right. Uh, down here, we're used to wintertime hay. There's no hay out there that you would use. Uh, so you have got to manage your country to where you've got standard feed when you go into winter. Uh, but that old desert's a fooler. If you can get 10 inches of rain out there and it'll fall at the right time, you can do everything out there and then some that you can do here with 40. But you've got to have it. Sure. But you can get 10 inches and it'll fall, if it falls at the right time, you can uh, run a cow 12 months out of the year on nothing but salt and mineral. And she'll raise a 650, 700 pound calf if she's the right kind of cow and breed back. Hmm. But the last four years I was out there, before I lost my lease, it rained two inches a year, four years in a row. And I ain't smart enough to ranch on two inches of rain. <laughs> you find me the guy that can. <laughs> I, finally <laughs> had to, I finally had to <laughs> haul a calf rope and give up. I had to get out of there. I couldn't handle it. Wow. And that was Van Horn, is that right? Yes. Out in that country? And that's, you still had cattle here as well. In oh, Colorado. yeah. I had I had a good man working for me in both places. And um, I'd go out there and stay two or three months, and then I'd come back down here and stay a couple of months. Van Horn days drive from anywhere in the world. And you didn't just run out there and check things and turn around and come back. Sure. You went out there and tended to your business, got it straight, then came down here and got it straight and went back and forth. Imagine by the time you got things straight there, you had things to take care of here. And by the time you had things straight here, you had... It was constantly... Constantly back and forth. Way, back and forth. Well, and, that's a good thing you had all that training on driving in your order buying days. <laughs> Cause that's different a, kind of driving. It was one trip out there. Sure. Well, that's a long haul from here to there. It was 540 miles house to house. Yeah. I can remember my days at uh, Butler Community College. It was 600 miles from doorstep to doorstep. And I can tell you by the time you get there, you, you may have to do stuff, but you wasn't real good at it by the time you was wore out from that, 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 that miles. And if you were pulling the trailer with about 10 horses on there, going that way, or, or a load of bulls or something like that, it was, you were glad when you got there. Well, and then you said you lost your lease out there and then come back and focused here around Caldwell. Is that? I, I, when I lost my lease out there, I came back down here. And um, I, had, I was running Brangus cattle. And I had about, but no registered cattle. I had about 500 Brangus cows, commercial cows. And I was feeding my calf crop instead of selling them. And I was putting what was advertised as the best Brangus bulls you could get your hands on 
on those cows. And my calves would feed three, four, five dollars below the yard average. They'd uh, grade, I mean, they'd yield oh, bump 65, just bam, bam, bam. Mm -hmm. But I could not get them to grade choice. If I got 25% choice, it was an exceptional group. And I just decided I'm gonna see if I can't breed a Brangus that will grade choice. And so I got started with a set of Angus cows that had lots of carcass quality in them. And over a period of time, I found some Brangus, uh, some Brahmin bulls that I could get my hands on that their calves would grade. And of course, at that point in time, and to the to this day, I mean, there's still the story that eared cattle won't grade. Well, eared cattle will grade if they're the right eared cattle. But anyhow, I started to see if I could do that. And I had a set of half-blood bulls that I'd raised. I don't know, there's 12, 15 of them. And I, so I put them on feed to see how they'd gain. And gain has always been really important to me. And um, by the time I got them grown and figured, and I got to check it what I had in them. And uh, this cost a little more than I figured it was going to cost to get this education. <laughs> so I got on the phone and I went to try and sell a set of half-blood bulls. And uh, I knew a man in Florida that was in the Brahmin business down there, and I called him, told him, I said I had a half set of half-blood black bulls. And um, he told me a commercial rancher down there that might accidentally be interested in him. And I called him, talked to him, and I sold him the bulls. And um, I had another set <coughs> next year, and I sold them to him again. And I got to thinking, you know, that was back in the Camp Cooley days and uh, Joe Resnicek days and such as that. You know, there ain't no need for me to fool around, with, go head to head with these people in the Brangus business. I've got these percentage cattle. I think I'll just see if I can't sell these percentage cattle. And um, I developed, I, I went to Florida every year in October. Spent 10 days down there, visited around with ranchers, and developed a clientele down there and along the Gulf Coast of Texas for those half-blood cattle. Mm -hmm. And uh, the old half-blood bulls, they're tough. Uh, they can go to that, those that go into, that the Seminole tribe buys, when they get off the bus down there, they go into the Everglades. And down on the Gulf Coast here in Texas, below Anahuac and down in that country down there, same situation. I've got a really, really good friend down there that I don't know how many half-blood bulls I've sold him down through the years, but he gets the top end of whatever I've got. And uh, I have been on the ranch riding with him. Uh, and seeing those cattle standing in water six, eight inches deep, grazing the grass off the t above the water. And those half-blood bulls will live like that, maintain their flesh, and breed a cow. Mm -hmm. huh. Now, it might be your neighbor's cow. They're going to breed one somewhere. <laughs> there. I can promise you that. A heterosis is a is a is a beautiful thing there. <laughs> it, uh, but in the the in that country, a straight bed animal will not survive. This same man, the first set of cattle I sold him, we I sold him about ten bulls, and uh, we sat there for an hour arguing over a hundred dollars. And finally, 
we traded. I don't remember. It, it was more of a concession on my part, just wanting to get rid of him than it was his. But uh, when we made our trade, it was a handshake deal. He said, you know, Lee, you think I'm tough. But when I buy 10 young bulls and I turn them out on my ranch, and I'd never been on his ranch then, I turn them on my ranch, and the first year, three of them die. Another three of them gets to the end, I got to spend $500 a piece to get them fed back up to where I can do something with them, either sell them or use them again. When I divide what I've got left into what I've spent, they're not that cheap. And I said, you know, I hadn't thought about that. I don't know your country, but I'm going to tell you one thing I'll do. He said, what's that? I said, I'll bet you $1,000 right now that these bulls that you're walking out of here with, you'll divide more of them into what you've got left than you ever have before. He said, I'm not going to bet you, and I hope you're right. Now, if he needs bull season starts, my only question is, how many do you need? Right. Yeah. It's the value of building that, building that trust up and having a proven And have, have the product, product. That, that will do it. Absolutely. And that's uh, the, the halves. The females are ideal for replacements. Mm -hmm. The steer calves have got too much bee sting on them. They're not as likely to grade. They're harder to sell. Sure. But would you rather have a steer calf that's a little bit hard to sell or an open cow? Right. And that's what keeps those halves working. Sure. Well, and I guess, um, you know, you talked about developing your, and it's something we've talked about quite a bit on previous episodes that we've done, but developing your customer base and actually spending time on those ranches, that that's got to be a huge thing once to to develop a relationship with your customers and, and actually be on their place, whether it's here local or somewhere. You've got to do it. You've got to do it. I think, in my opinion, Ben and I have talked about this a little bit. That's, I, I think it's almost a lost art a little bit. We, we've gotten to where we're not as, uh, where we get lazy. We want to just, you know, send that email or a text message or something like that, and people value so much some one-on-one -on -one interaction and somebody who will take the time to as another good friend of ours will say go and kick turds a little bit and, and see where see what those cows actually deal with and where your bulls are actually going and i, I think you've, you've probably taken as good of advantage of doing that as as anybody it's and i enjoy doing it too mm -hmm. I do. and it gives you it makes you do a better job producing them because you understand more about what is needed in certain situations well, folks, that's going to wrap up part one of our conversation with Lee Offord. While we've already covered a wide range of topics, the good news is there's more to come. We'd like to invite you to join us for our next episode of the Beef Pros Podcast as we continue visiting more with Lee Offord. Hey friends, thanks for listening to this episode of the Beef Pros Podcast. We really enjoyed putting it together and hope you enjoy listening. We would love to have you stop by iTunes or Stitcher and give us a review. Also subscribe there. Uh, you can check out beefpros.com and get previous episodes and check out some pictures. And we'll be posting new things throughout the coming weeks and months. And you can also stop by our Facebook page. Just search Beef Pros Podcast and that'll get you right there. We love the feedback. Keep it coming. and Let us know what you're looking for in future episodes. So share with your friends. Subscribe. Give us some feedback. And we really, really appreciate it. The challenge is coming. It's here. Yes, sir. Two years from now, I'll answer whether I'm a pro or not. <laughs> but I can't tell you right now. <laughs> <laughs>